Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and we got a great topic here to talk about today. And joining me is Dr. Stephen Warren. He's a professor at the University of Iowa. He's the professor of history and program coordinator of Native American Indigenous Studies. He's written multiple books about the Shawnee, and that's going to be our topic today. But thank you for joining us, Dr. Warren. How are you doing? Thank you. Thanks for asking me, Jameson. Well, um, first off, let's just start off with your connection to Kentucky um, and so forth, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Well, one of my favorite places on the planet is Berea, Kentucky, and um, I uh, used to teach at Eastern Kentucky University and uh, you know, climbed the, uh, the mountains of, uh, of uh, the county there, and, and I really enjoyed my time. Um, so I, I miss Kentucky. It's a beautiful state. Well, um, of course, probably most people listening to the podcast and myself are a little biased about uh, <laughs> how, <laughs> uh, how, how awesome it is, but it's good to get a, you know, reassuring approval. Oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to talk about uh, the Shawnee tribe today um, sure. and, and multiple aspects of it. And we'll, we'll just go uh, through as much as we can. Um, but, sure. you know, we've, we've been talking a lot on the podcast about the frontiersmen and, and Sure. Uh, that that side of things, but we're gonna kind of mm-hmm. switch over because you know there's more to the story as in all of history, mm-hmm. um, and uh, mm-hmm. we kind of want to give the Shawnee their their due as well and talk a little sure. bit about them. Um, sure. So, as a whole, I mean, you've spent many years uh, looking into the Shawnee. Mm-hmm. What what sets them aside that's different from say other tribes? Uh, well, that's a big question and, and <laughs> hard to, hard to break down, but I thought that, I thought that, you know, something that I would like to do is maybe start with the present day. Uh-huh. So there are three federally recognized, uh, Shawnee tribes, uh, in the United States. Now the Eastern Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma, the absentee Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma and the Shawnee tribe. And so, um, all three of those nations, uh, were removed, um, uh-huh to what is now Oklahoma. Um, and so their homeland is Kentucky and Ohio, but, but that's where they are now. And um, <clears throat> what's somewhat distinctive about the Shawnee um, is that uh, their name for themselves, the Shawnee means Southerners in Central Algonquian. And so they're one of the Southernmost uh, or the Southernmost Algonquian, Central Algonquian speakers. Um, and so uh, their homeland truly is, you know, Ohio and, and Kentucky. Um, so, uh, and, and another characteristic of, of the, their people is, is that um, they've always had a kind of a diffident relationship to nationalism. And so most Shawnee people lived in fairly autonomous villages in the time period we're talking about, you know, in in the 17th century, 16th century, 18th century. Um, And so, um, you know, they they didn't have a kind of a unified leadership structure or national government modeled after the United States. And you can see that in evidence today in Oklahoma with the three distinct nations. there are other native nations um, that consolidated as a nation uh, much more uh, smoothly and quickly than did the Shawnee. That is a loaded question, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a lot. Um, 
And you know something that something that is the the central myth about Kentucky is that is that uh, there were no uh, native villages there, mm-hmm. and um, and so you know I, I'd kind of like to to talk about that because you know I've done a lot of research uh, mapping um, Shawnee villages, and in fact there there were uh, many um, villages both in the you know, in the pre-contact period and in, in the historic period. And, and one of the reasons why uh, the Shawnees fought so desperately for Kentucky in the era of Daniel Boone and mm-hmm. Simon Kenton and all those folks that you talked about um, is because of their economy. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I was thinking today, you know, as, as I was getting ready for this podcast, that, you know, if we just decided tomorrow that, you know, it was okay to hunt Canadian geese, there wouldn't be any Canadian geese like in a month, you know, <laughs> they'd, they'd all be gone, you know, <laughs> same with deer. I was in Bloomington, Indiana the other day and I, and I was walking, um, I was walking down the middle of that town, you know, right in the center of it. And there was a deer walking down the street, Yeah, well. with, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> So, uh, so today, you know, there are these animals in our lives that are super abundant, but most Americans don't hunt, yeah. you know, and, and Kentuckians and Shawnees, um, they hunted, you know, for their survival and just having the settlers come into Kentucky had an enormous impact on the availability of game mm-hmm. because everyone was surviving. Yeah. on yeah. wild animals yeah and so uh so the carrying capacity of the land wasn't sufficient north of the ohio river mm-hmm. to maintain the shawnee people yeah. they had to have their hunting ground in kentucky mm-hmm. and the way people the way people lived back then is they had big summer villages mm-hmm. where they planted corn and beans and squash but then in October, from roughly October to March, they dispersed uh-huh. and they, they were often 200 miles, 300 miles from that summer villages, wow. from that summer village. And so, you know, it's much harder to find archaeologically a winter hunting camp uh-huh. than it is a summer village. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with 500 people, 1,000 people. Mm-hmm. You know, you can see that archaeologically. Uh, it's very hard to see 15 to 30 people in a winter hunting camp in Kentucky. We know yeah. a few of them, but not many. Yeah. The footprint is a lot diminished. So that's what people were fighting over. You know, mm-hmm. they were fighting over their normal range of mm-hmm. hunting, fishing, and gathering necessary for them to survive. Now the the disbursement or the, the dividing after the into the winter uh, hunting camps and stuff was that just solely just so it would be less people trying to survive off of less food or what was the do you think that is yeah the that's a good question that? yeah I think I think it has to do with again the economy right so like in in the summer you know from from the spring to the summer. Um, you could survive mainly on agricultural products and on salted meat. But if people uh, stayed in that summer village uh, year round, they would exhaust the ability to survive on wild animals. And so again, it's about the carrying capacity. It's mm-hmm. about it's about allowing people or allowing animals in the summer village area to recuperate. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and, then, and and so, you know, you have to kind of understand the carrying capacity of animals um, to keep the stock alive, to keep everything in balance, you know. And, and so so people learned, you know, how to kind of live, um, I guess, in uh, concert with the with the land and the animals. Yeah. That, well, that's a, that's a, you know, very smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, it that, is. You know, it is. Uh, to let let nature kind of re uh, replenish itself, you know, yes. and so forth. Um, and that's one thing. I, um, as I've dealt more into the history, you know, the, the common misconception is that you know, no native tribes. It was just as peaceful. You know, we know they just yeah. hunted here and all kind of stuff. But I, you know, over time, logically, that just you know, it doesn't make as much sense to me as it, it, yeah. it, it's perceived to be. Because like, 
they're, they're not, you know, a lot, they're not nomadic in the sense that they just constantly roam, but, you know, they don't stay in the same villages. Um, it wouldn't make sense that they would not get closer to their resources and, and, and get inside, you know, uh, the, the, the state lines of Kentucky, you know, um, uh, and, and when you look at the maps and stuff, uh, you know, old maps and stuff, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't add up, I guess, to me. Logically, I don't see why they wouldn't be in here living and stuff if uh, they were already right. using the resources. Um, well, you sort of have to ask yourself, you know, why would so many Shawnees fight and die for Kentucky? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, if, if it wasn't important to them. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's just logically, you know, he just wouldn't do it. And so, <laughs> um, so you know, their understanding of what was at stake, you mm-hmm. know, was was, uh, was pretty different. Well, yeah, and, and you know, to add on to that point, there's a reason there, there was no Navajo or Dakota who died fighting for Kentucky because they didn't need it, they didn't use it. Right. <laughs> you know, um, That's yeah, right. that makes sense. Right. Um, uh, well, uh, and, and I'll I'll let you talk. Let's talk about your books here real quick too, because you, you've got multiple ones. Um, and, and I'm I'm gonna be the uh, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, that, that uh, make make you choose. Which one was your favorite book? Which one? <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> Which one do you? Well, I uh, want to talk about I, yeah. I, because I'm on the Kentucky History podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to. I think it'd be a good idea to talk about the worlds the Shawnees made because, yeah. you know, one of the things that I, I wrote that book mm-hmm. to explain uh, the fact that uh, the Ford Ancient people. Mm-hmm. Um, who have a deep archaeological signature in Kentucky are the um, ancestors of the modern Shawnee tribes. Okay. Uh, not exclusively. Yeah. There are other native nations that were part of the Ford ancient world. Mm-hmm. But um, the archaeological record confirms that these were Shawnee people. Mm-hmm. And so if we take a longer view of Native American history. And we start it in say 1400 mm-hmm. rather than 1768, yeah. you know, or 1790, then we can start to see really profound connections between the modern Shawnee people and their, uh, their archeological ancestors. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's what that book was about. And I feel like I, I feel like I proved it. I mean, no one else has, uh, has come on me and said, you know, Hey, um, you're, you're full of it, uh, yet. Um, but, uh, I'm sure they will after listening to this podcast, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but, but the problem with disconnecting modern tribes from his, from archeologically known communities is that um, it divorces Native Americans uh, from their deep history and their deep connection to the land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that has all sorts of repercussions for Native Americans today. Um, So if you are a Native American and you're a Shawnee today, before I wrote my book, people were arguing, you know, that, look, they just emerged out of the ether. We don't know, you know, where they came from. We don't know who their people were. Literally, Shawnee history began uh, with Daniel Boone. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was kind of messed up. Yeah, so well, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's good. That's good. Um, I mean, they didn't come down in a spaceship. Yeah. You know, they, oh yeah. yeah, they, yeah. They, they came from somewhere, and that somewhere is, is Kentucky and Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, cause, and, and, and correct me if you're wrong, if I'm wrong, cause I, I, I very well may be, um, cause uh, you know, I, I read, and, and this is probably, you know, this is probably not the best source and stuff as, uh, either, but you know, a popular to Frontiers, Kentucky, you know, you've got Alan Eckert who wrote the yeah. Frontiers Man and you got, uh, uh, Sorrow in Our, in Our Heart that's focused on Tecumseh and yeah. so forth. Um, yeah. how accurate are those books? <laughs> 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 well, I, I don't like to, uh, I, th- those books are, those books are really cherished mm-hmm. by well, many, many people in Kentucky. And right? they're great to read, like they're very entertaining to read and, and good. I, I take it as in, I, I feel like he takes some liberties, you know, uh, because there's not, mm-hmm. 
you know, there's not really this documentation of these tribal meetings as much as, um, right. you know, people want to, uh, uh, think there is, I guess, but, and, and, and is it, uh, you know, yeah, I guess that's the, my best thought is that it, there's some, there's some liberties taken that probably aren't there. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as events well, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so I read historical fiction, Yeah. you know, I'm, I'm an avid reader and, and I read novels, I read historical fiction and I read history books. And I, I guess for the audience out there, what I would say is it's important to know that people like uh, Alan Eckert and James Alexander Tom uh, write historical fiction. Mm -hmm. So they aren't beholden to the historical and archaeological record mm -hmm. the way that I am. You know, mm -hmm. in, in the worlds the Shawnees made and these other other books, I can only I'm only allowed to to say or to to write what is provable um, in the archaeological record. Whereas folks like Eckert and Tom, they can create whole scenes, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that are imagined. Yeah. And, you know, that's just a boundary that I can't cross as a, yeah. as a practicing historian. So I would just encourage folks you know, to, to explore what historians have written, because there's a lot of good work out there. Oh yeah. Oh, plenty. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's not my, uh, uh, thing. And I, I, I love the frontiersman. It's a, it's a great book. I love reading it. I've read it multiple times. Uh, <laughs> but you know, having that thought, cause in reading that book, you know, it led me to reading the one about Tecumseh and, you know, this has led me down the more, more of the rabbit hole of the Shawnee and what, what they had and, what they did and as far as Kentucky goes, you know, um, and, and I bring that up because it, it seems like in, in some of those books as well, you know, the Shawnee really cherished Kentucky and, you know, their, their land, you know, this was their inherited land that, that had belonged to them. Uh, you know, I can't think of the, um, that was the great, the great father or, um, the, um, that promised him, promised them that, you know, it's been, it's been a little bit, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just push. I would just encourage you to to read beyond that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, contrary to popular opinion, some history books, uh, history monographs, are, are actually well written and yeah. enjoyable to read. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying mine are, but I'm just saying I hope that a lot of folks uh, push beyond historical fiction. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that people get a more accurate rendering, and you know, something that um, that Eckert. Uh, and James Alexander Tom and those other folks do, you know, is they, they have a tendency to focus their stories around uh, very specific men, right? So mm -hmm. they tell the Tecumseh story, the Blue Jacket story, yeah. you know, they, they tell, uh, you know, the corn planter story or the corn stalk story. Um, and it's almost as if, you know, you're imagining Shawnee people without women, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and children yeah. Yeah. and um you know that and and it leads you to believe that the shawnee people did nothing else but fight right. yeah. <laughs> they were just warriors yeah. and um and something uh that you know is super important for folks to come away with is that the shawnee had a had uh they still do uh -huh. they had a divided polity uh -huh. and so uh, they do have patrilineal descent but they divide the leadership of their community between women and men. Mm -hmm. So women are in charge in the spring and summer, and men are in charge in the fall and winter. Wow. Yeah. And, and so literally half of the year, they have a female chief mm. who calls the shot, shots about where to plant, when to plant, when the ceremonies are going to go down. Um, and Shawnee people, you know, believe that plants like corn are feminine mm. and that they should only be handled by women. Wow. You know, and, yeah. and so, so the women were the agriculturalists mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, that's my problem with Eckert and Tom and those folks is, it's like, you know, well, that's true. Like most of the time, you know, people were living. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and uh, and running their lives as we all do. And, and women had an enormous authority. But but we his, we uh, settler historians have a tendency to not write about that. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah um yeah and um which uh, that that i guess brings us into a good talk a good point to talk about the culture and stuff how uh, the culture was a bit uh different and and, you know i'll ask this question again well well shawnee culture versus other tribes i mean anything that's completely different or similarities and so forth well one i mean the, the big distinction you know between the shawnee um and their neighbors is that uh the shawnees moved at a greater distance mm-hmm. uh as a result of colonialism than any other community i know of and wow. so yeah. so um if you think about uh about colonialism you know when it when it starts um which for for Native North Americans is in 1540 with, or 1539 with their Hernando de Soto expedition. Yeah. You know, he travels through the Southeast and that creates uh, all sorts of repercussions. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it introduces uh, violence on a scale never seen before. Mm-hmm. It introduces domesticated animals. You know, it, it introduces uh, virgin soil diseases. Mm-hmm. Um and so right about 1540, um, you know, you see this massive diaspora out of Kentucky and Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have Shawnee villages emerging in, uh, in what is now Augusta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. You, have, you have Shawnee villages emerging in Alabama. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's a big story. And what's fascinating to me about it is when the Shawnee people were part of the Fort Ancient world, yeah, they, they were basically sedentary agriculturalists. So okay. they, they were farmers. Yeah. And they dispersed to, you know, their, their winter hunting camps, but they were never that far from their home and then suddenly you know as a result of colonization people are moving you know 500 600 700 800 miles away from their uh their homes yeah wow um now and and a few few things that the DeSoto now to my understanding he came up uh to about South Carolina North Mm -hmm. Carolina and then came west and then came up through say tennessee and kentucky and then back mm-hmm. down to mississippi he died well uh t- towards the end of the mississippi i believe right or something like that yeah that, uh, yeah. yeah 1541 or something like yeah. that yeah 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 is when yeah. he finally vanished from the scene yeah, yeah so go ahead well well you know and out of all the you know he was probably i don't know the things i've read about him is not not too positive <laughs> no no not, not too flattering no no uh, with, uh, taking like people a... hostage um you know uh, he just was accustomed to intimidation yeah yeah and rule by force yeah, yeah. just i mean yeah uh but then uh the other um uh uh, question or the thing um, I said you, you mentioned this uh, before and you've used this term and um, the four um, what, what's the term you're saying the tribes of the four the um, oh the Ford ancient people Ford ancient people is that what it, is that no Fort is F O R T yeah Ford ancient yeah yeah that's the that's the name uh-huh. given to uh, the latest archaeological group. Um, or culture uh, yeah. that inhabited Kentucky and Ohio, okay, and parts of Indiana. Actually. Okay, so the, the Fort Ancient people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, and I bring that up too. Uh, I know I was in Montgomery County, Kentucky, a while back, and mm-hmm. you know they they always call it the Andes Mounds or whatever. Some people call yeah. it that, and that's not you know that's not the name. <laughs> that's not, not the name. That, that, I think it, if I'm correct, that the person who discovered it was it that yeah. you know that's not the name of the people that were living here it's just, no. <laughs> no in fact all of those uh names for mounds and and fort ancient you know those mm-hmm. those are all inventions yeah of the archaeological people you know or, or, or of the archaeolog archaeologists you know yeah. who, who initially dug those those uh, mounds 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, they have no connection to native names. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, I mean, 15, you know, hundreds, uh, that, that sort of time, um, that would have been, I guess the time the Shawnee were, well, even before then, how, how, how early can we say, is that the earliest we can say that the Shawnee people were in this area in Kentucky or. I, I would put it at about a thousand AD. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you know, for, for certain, that's when the Fort ancient culture emerges out of um, the Hopewell and Adena. And so, um, and, and we've mapped those communities and, and, you know, they, they uh, maintain a lot of the characteristics, you know, wow. of Shawnee villages. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm going to try to put this in my head here. Cause this, this is, this is very good stuff. A very interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm adding, I'm adding more books to my long reading book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So let's say, you know, a thousand AD, the Shawnee people are here and so forth. And then DeSoto comes in and kind of, you know, r- ransacks the place and really messes mm-hmm. everything up. The Shawnee mm-hmm. people, and that's 1500 some, they, they spread mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. Um, and then mm-hmm. s- slowly make their way back to, or how does that go from then, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's paradoxical because I, I need to take one step back in that timeline that you created. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, so basically, uh, in, in the, in the 17th century, mm-hmm. there are Virginians, um, who, uh, and, and South Carolinians who are pretty invested in the Native American slave trade. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they they arm Native Americans um, in their immediate vicinity on the Atlantic coast and encourage them to raid uh, people um, in the interior. And so slave raiding becomes a, a real problem, you know, for for people in Kentucky, you know, for people in you know Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. Um, and the reason it's a problem is that the Native Americans along the Atlantic coast are armed. Mm-hmm. They have guns. Yeah. And the folks on the interior don't. Yeah. And so, so what the, the Shawnee do, which is, is kind of counterintuitive in a way, but makes sense, is they um, move toward colonizers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and basically they strike a devil's bargain with colonizers and they say, you know, look, you know, if if you arm us, you know, we'll supply you with slaves, Um, you know, and so the Shawnees established this, uh, well, first they, they destroy a a troublesome community called the Westo Mm -hmm. um, who are affiliated with the British uh, at Augusta, Georgia. And then they, they literally um, take possession of, of their principal village after they destroy them and they become the kind of dominant group, you know, Mm -hmm. right, right there um, at the falls of the fall line of the Savannah river. Uh Um, And they live that way until roughly 1725 um, in, you know, Maryland, Pennsylvania, South Carolina. But what happens after that is, you know, there is a, and, and this is kind of a long rabbit hole that your listeners don't need to go down with me. But <laughs> but uh, around 1715, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, the English decide uh, that the African slave trade is preferable to the Native American slave trade, mm-hmm. and so that go that diminishes yeah. in popularity, and and then the English become really invested in Native American land, and so there's a lot of so there's a lot of dispossession that begins happening mm-hmm. between those former allies. And so, uh, so Native Americans, such as the Shawnee, begin returning to Ohio and Kentucky at roughly 1720. Gotcha. All right. Well, there you go. That, that, that completes my... <laughs> that, 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 I, I understand. And that makes... I mean, it, it's, it's a lot of points that I don't think people... Um, consider or even think about like how how that happens or how they ended up where they were and and, and so forth um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but yeah that, that uh that paints isn't it isn't it fascinating i mean you think about like i just think about people 
and the, the, the ways people figure out how to survive yeah. in the context of their time. I mean, if you're faced with enslavement, mm-hmm. is it better to be an enslaver? You know, that's a, that's a tough, that's yeah. a tough question, you that's, know, and yeah. I, I think about some of the things that we, some of the decisions that Americans make today. Mm-hmm. you know that that seem contrary to our morals you know mm-hmm. to our ethics but we do it you know because uh-huh. it's about survival yeah uh yeah and like again it goes back to resources like you know right. the resources and that um th- that that settles if you look back at many conflicts uh in history resources are just about at the top of every one of them yeah, uh, you know, it's hardly mm-hmm. ever really, you know, anything else. Honestly, you know, it's mm-hmm. all about resources and, and, and who controls mm-hmm. those resources. And uh, that's and right. So forth. Yeah, it's, and it's, so the so so the resource that was valuable during the early early colonial period was uh, was Native Americans themselves. Yeah, uh-huh. their bodies, their labor. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but then when that tapped out circa 1715, then the commodity that was valuable, that became land. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and secondarily, uh, fur bearing animals, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the deer skin trade was always Beaver super trade, cool. all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but those are, you know, but, but again, but that's about resources, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. And even if you go up to, uh, you know, a few, a few decades later, you get in the French and or basically, you know, who could control the uh, the beaver trade and, and, and right. so forth, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Who and, and when you sit back and think you you're like, why in the world were they so obsessed with you know with the beavers? <laughs> but yeah. as a resource, well, because a very, there was a global market. You know? Yeah, very expensive why? reset resource. <laughs> I mean, some uh, years from now people are gonna say, Why were they so obsessed with oil? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, well, it, the global market, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, those who control the oil control the power and all that good stuff. That's right. Know? That's right. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. Um, so what? What? Um, you know that it, 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 you've painted a great picture, um, uh, or a more understanding picture, and I, I just don't think people really, you, you know, uh, think about that because other <clears throat> um, um, maybe misconception is you know during these early stages, you know, Native Americans weren't weren't slaves, you know, the African Americans were, were, were the slaves. Uh, but you know, that happened pre and that, you know, you explained mm-hmm. the reason why it, it changed. Mm-hmm. Um, any other kind of misconceptions that really stick out to you that uh, I'm, on your end, you know, there, there's things that frustrate me on my end that people are like, no, that's just not how it was, but uh, anything else? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think uh, I've been reading a lot of documents from the 1790s Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for my own research. Uh, and just yesterday, I was reading George Washington's Secretary of War, Henry Knox, mm-hmm. explain that, uh, that Native Americans are the owners of the land. Uh-huh. And, you know, and, and, you know, Knox, and all the revolutionary Americans went uh, to great lengths to, uh, to sign treaties with the owners of the land that that legally transferred the land, you know, to the United States. And so a big misconception that a lot of people have about Native Americans um, is that they are a race of people. Mm -hmm. And what those treaties demonstrate is that Native Americans uh, were were and are nations. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they were literally treated as foreign powers. Yeah. So a treaty between China and the United States today, yeah. you know, is the equivalent of a treaty between the United States and the Shawnee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in the U.S. Constitution, Native Americans are, are treated as foreign powers, as, as, as nations. Mm-hmm. And, you know, today when folks talk about uh, Native Americans, they seem to have forgotten the fact that they're part of governments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and th- that's what distinguishes Native Americans from other racial and ethnic groups. You know, you can't say the same thing about the Latinx population or the African American population or, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. uh, 
Um, and so, so Native Americans are, are citizens of, um, of governments that were once autonomous from the United States. Yeah. Uh, well, that, and that's, you know, that's very true. I w often um, kind of think of like, what, what was the, I guess, the positive outcome that what, what could have happened that would have, you know, uh, been more uh, positive instead of like, cause you know, you're getting into uh, the trail of tears and, and all those yeah. hardships and those, those kind of, you know, I mean, terrible things, yeah. you know, what could have prevented all that stuff uh, from happening, you know, and I, uh, I, I don't have an answer. I don't, you know, I don't know if anybody has an answer, but that's kind of like, uh, you know, one, one of the things that when I think about, cause as you said, you know, these were nations and stuff mm -hmm. and, and I, th I, I kind of feel like those, maybe those founding fathers saw them as nations, did. Uh, but then maybe the, the next generation yeah. of, of politicians did not have That's that. Right. Uh, same, uh, uh, well, and, and one of the reasons why is power. I mean, <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, the reason why Eckert and those guys sell books that are really popular is, is, uh, is, you know, Native Americans and, you know, up through Tecumseh's time posed a real threat to the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, they militarily they were incredible, yeah. you know, and so, yeah. so in 1791. You know, at St. Clair's defeat, um, the Native American Alliance killed more than 900 American soldiers. It's the, the largest defeat of an American military by any Native group. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and so, uh, so that was their context. Yeah. You know, and, and today, you know, people probably think, oh, okay, they're nations, but they're weak. Yeah. You know, they're, yeah. they don't think yeah, about yeah. the military prowess of these nations mm -hmm. in the in the colonial period. Yeah. Well and I you know, I know, you know, they, they talk about just how well in the in, you know, the, the in, in the native sense, if you you know added all of them up, you know, they would have outnumbered a mm -hmm. lot. You know, uh, compo as compared to say the um, uh, colonial settlers and and so forth, and you know, and, and more came obviously from uh, Europe and other places. Um, but you know, just the number of um, uh, native or indigenous people that were in America already, oh, yeah. uh, you know, was what was you know just not not even comparable. Right. I guess, Doctor Warren, uh, I, I got to say, you know, this has been very enlightening. I, I've really enjoyed it. Um, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of questions, but I don't think we have time to answer them all. Um, you know, I, as far as the Shawnee in Kentucky, um, you know, you know, I, I, would that would, and this is probably not a good question to ask, but were, would they be the most, would they have the biggest claim to Kentucky compared to other tribes or were, were they the most inf influential? Um, you know, mm. In hindsight, you know we're a bit jaded. I, you know, I, I read all these books, these all these frontiers books, and you know they they, they bring up all these tribes. Yeah. You know, this tribe was uh, sieged this fort or whatever. Yeah. But I see Shawnee the most. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess what do you got on that? Yeah. <laughs> well, Kentucky is a very a very long state, um, and so you know I've driven across it many times, and so it kind of depends on where you're talking about. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, so Western Kentucky has uh has different you know tribal affiliations you know that than uh -huh. eastern kentucky or or southeastern kentucky versus southwestern kentucky and so you got to put native communities like the cherokee in there you know you got to talk about the choctaw and the chickasaw you know um you know if you're talking about like northwestern Kentucky, you know, I would include Illinois groups, you know, down there where, where Kentucky and Illinois converge, um, you know, so, so there are, you know, population, there are many populations with a claim to Kentucky. Um, but there, I think the reason why the Shawnee dominate the literature so much is because of how hard they fought for their, for the control of the state. Yeah. You know, gotcha. and, and, and that is distinctive. Um, they they uh, lost many 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 uh, people, you know, trying to hold on to uh, to Kentucky. 
um, and the war was uh, the, the war that they the wars that they fought were incredibly brutal. And so I, I think that, you know, on both sides, you know, bo- both sides saw no distinction between combatants and non-combatants the way we do now. You know, women and children were fair game. You know, people were scalped and murdered. On the flip side of that, Kentuckians um, tried to starve Native Americans. So one of their main tactics was was burning um yeah. Yeah. Whole village, whole village. yeah 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 and yeah. and so um you know this was a really brutal and prolonged war a lot of folks think like that it was pretty quick you know but but it really wasn't you know when you stop and think about it i mean we're talking about like from the 1770s you know through the 1790s you know more than more than 20 yeah. years you know people you know fighting and dying through this Conflict. land yeah yeah and even even if you you know you begin to think of the war of 1812 right. and, you know not not as many battles in kentucky no. so uh, as 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 that but if you throw that in there you're looking at a, a 40 year war yeah yeah know? which which in a historian's terms is two generations wow. you know, so, <laughs> so think about that you know um yeah. this was far from a quick and decisive thing you know this was a yeah. prolonged yeah. genocidal conflict but yeah, that yeah. makes that makes yeah. their history popular, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, not 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 the reasons you want no. your history to be popular, no. I guess. You know? no. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, uh, Dr. Warren, um, I, I think that's a good stop stopping point. Um, uh, to kind of wrap it up. Um, what? Uh, how can people get a hold of you? Your books? How can they get a hold of your books and that that sort of stuff? Um, you know, I'm, uh, if you want to I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty Googleable on uh, <laughs> on Amazon, and and I do have an email address through you, Iowa. Um, please, uh-huh. you know, feel free to. I can't promise a response, but but uh, but I'll I'll try. Um, and yeah, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. And and Jameson, I just want to give you a shout out. You know for uh, being an elementary school teacher and, and being curious about your state's history. You know, your students are lucky to have you. Oh, well, well thank you. Uh, uh, as long as they stay away. <laughs> you know, <I> can, uh... <laughs> well, that's every teacher's, so, you know, first, first yeah. goal. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, um, again, uh, thank you again for coming on. And, you know, uh, next book comes out, uh, or maybe even we, we you know, Get go in depth in some more of these other books. Uh, you you are welcome to come back on and uh, talk some more uh, uh, Shawnee Shawnee history or, or any other history as far as that goes. So that sounds great. Uh, thanks again for joining us and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel. The stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Knight Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville.